Today on America's Test Kitchen, Bridget and Julie have unlocked the secrets to a foolproof chocolate cream pie. Jack challenges Bridget to a cocoa powder tasting. And Elle makes Julia the perfect dark chocolate pud sauce. It's all coming up right here on America's Test Kitchen. I was lucky enough to go to a high school located right across from a diner and they made a mean chocolate cream pie. Silky, smooth, lots of chocolate flavor. But it's pretty hard to replicate that at home until now. Julia is here <laughs> and she's gonna show us a perfect chocolate cream pie from the crust up. That's it. And before we get to the filling, let's talk about the crust. Because okay. I'm gonna show you a new crust today. <gasps> and that's a big deal from us. It's a huge yeah, deal. Yeah, we yes. made a lot of pie crust. We wanted it easy to roll out. We wanted it flaky and we wanted it foolproof. You want it all. I do. And you want it now. And I'm not ashamed to say it. <laughs> <laughs> all right, starting with the most important ingredient in a pie crust, the butter. 10 tablespoons of unsalted butter. And again, we're just making a single crust pie. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take this stick of butter and I'm just gonna make a mark on the two tablespoon mark, unwrap it. Okay. I'm gonna use the rest of the wrapping as a handle and I'm gonna grate two tablespoons of the butter. Cold butter is pretty key here. We're gonna grate some of the butter, put it in the freezer and fold it in towards the end so we get the flavor and the tenderness without making the crust too wimpy. There we go, right to the wrapper. That last little piece. Now I'm gonna put this in the freezer until we need it so it stays nice and cold. Okay. For the rest of this butter, it's gonna unwrap it and we're gonna cut it into half inch chunks. So I cut it lengthwise into quarters and then you can just cut it crosswise into nice even half inch chunks. So again, that's 10 tablespoons total, two got grated and eight tablespoons are cut into chunks. Now it's time to go to the food processor, okay. which is our favorite way of making pie dough. It sure is. This is something you've never seen before. It's not just one dough, it's two doughs mixed together. And when you think of it that way, this is gonna make total sense. Okay. Okay, so we're gonna make the first dough, and I have some of the flour. Weighing the flour is pretty helpful here when you're making pie dough. Sure. So I'm gonna give you the weights. So this is three quarters of a cup of flour, all-purpose flour. That weighs three and three quarter ounces. Okay. To that, I'm gonna add a tablespoon of sugar, just a little sweetness. This is half a teaspoon of salt. And I'm just gonna pulse these together, about two pulses. Now in goes the butter. And this is where things get pretty different from our previous pie doughs. Normally we just pulse this in until they made small pea-sized pieces. That's what I'm expecting. Mm -hmm. For this dough, I'm just gonna let it rip for about 30 seconds. It's gonna make a solid piece of dough, and that's good. We're waterproofing the flour at this point. So all that flour will be coated with butter, and it won't absorb the moisture that we add later. So we're just gonna let this rip for about 30 seconds until it makes a nice, solid dough. There we go. Can I just say we've spent the last 10 years telling people not to do exactly what she just did. I know. Yeah. It's rebellion right here. <laughs> All right, so you can see this dough is totally unlike a pie dough. It's actually more like a cookie dough if you think about it's it. It's kind of plastic. This won't make gluten. This will be our very tender dough. All right. Oh, so I'm just gonna take this, I'm gonna break it up into little pieces around the blade. And on top of this dough, we're gonna make dough number two. Oh. So here's the tender dough, and now we're gonna build a second dough on top of it that absorbs water to create structure. So here we have half a cup of flour, and again in weight, this is two and a half ounces. We're gonna sprinkle this over the top. All right, and we're just gonna pulse this in about four or five pulses, just until it's incorporated. Okay, you can see that the flour has really incorporated into that oh, yeah. cookie dough, mm -hmm. so it looks like crumbles again. It sure does. And that's perfect. That's what we like to see in a pie dough. Yes. Yes. Back to where we're comfortable, right? <laughs> All right, so now we're gonna dump this into a bowl. Now we're gonna go into the freezer and get the frozen shredded butter. We're gonna add this, and you can see it's really nice and firm. And again, when we added just two more tablespoons of butter to that first dough, it made it much too mushy. Really? Yeah, but putting it in like this, it doesn't get in the way of the dough structure, and it actually adds to the flakiness. That is some crazy stuff. <laughs> Last but not least, water. Well, we're not gonna hold back on the water. We're gonna add enough water so this dough is really easy to roll out, because believe it or not, we've made it so tender, we can add an extra tablespoon or two. We're gonna start with two tablespoons, and notice I'm using ice water. You wanna keep the dough as cold as possible, so you don't want that frozen butter to melt. Right. Just gonna stir that in. We gotta preserve those frozen flakes as much as we can. So that was two tablespoons. Now I'm gonna add another two tablespoons. All right, now this is gonna look familiar. Just pressing with the spatula to try to get it to form a nice dough. 
Mm. Oh, that's perfect. And the outside of the bowl is nice and cold from that ice water, so. Yep. All right, so I'm gonna do the rest of my forming on a nice piece of plastic wrap. Okay. I'm just gonna take this dough, plop it on this right in the center. Looks very hydrated at this point. <laughs> it's gonna be such a dream to roll out. All right. What I like to do is just take the sides of the plastic wrap and my knuckles sort of through the plastic mm -hmm. wrap and just gently shape it into a nice five inch round. You wanna get rid of any of those fissures as best you can. Little fault lines that will continue to grow when you go to roll it that's out, That's right? it, that's right. And then I like to do this. Really get it nice and round. If you get it nice and round at this point, it's much easier to have it stay round as you roll it out later. Let me wrap it up. Oh, and you can see, oh, those nice big flakes Tricky. of butter in there. Yeah. It's an interesting looking dough, and that's good. So into the fridge this goes for at least two hours before we roll it out. But you can make this up to two days ahead of time. Okay. All right, Bridget, I have something special for you here. What happened? Exactly, kind of looks moldy. So what we did here is we put a little food coloring, blue food coloring, in the water to illustrate that there are two doughs. There's these big pockets of brown dough that didn't absorb any water. Right. That's that first dough we made that was waterproofed with all that butter. And then you can see this dough in between that is very blue. That's the second dough we made that we didn't waterproof, so it absorbed all that water and made gluten. So here's your tender bits of dough. All the blue dough is your structure dough. Mm -hmm. And when you mix them together like this, that's how you get flaky layers. So this is the key to perfect pie dough. What looked so odd before, <laughs> now it's beautiful to me. Yeah, all right, so let's roll out our pie dough. It's been sitting out for about 10 minutes, so it's perfect to roll out. I'm just gonna use a well-floured counter Usually when you roll out pie dough, you don't want to add any extra flour because you don't want to dry it out. Exactly. Not with this dough. So we're going to roll it out into a 12 inch circle. You know, over the years I have come across different ways to roll out a disc of dough like this. And I've landed on this one. Okay. I put my rolling pin down and I angle it on one side and I just roll out one side at a time. A little turn, roll it out. A little turn, roll it out. I do something very similar. Do you? Yeah, everybody has a different style. Mm -hmm. My whole thing is that if you get it to a circle, plus it doesn't matter how you got there. <laughs> exactly. Truth be told, we're gonna trim off the edges anyway. So even if it's an amoeba shape, it's fine. Now what size are we looking for we're here? We're looking for a 12 inch circle. I mean, even though you didn't dye that one blue, I can still see those little flakes of grated frozen butter in there. I know, isn't that great? Looking like we're getting there. That looks perfect. Now for the hard part, getting the dough into the pie plate. We're gonna use a standard nine inch pie plate. Just drape it back over the pie plate. Easy as pie. All right, so I'm just lifting the edge of the dough so the dough can fall down into the corner of the pie plate. You don't want to stretch it because that corner is a structural fault in a pie. You want it to be sturdy. All right, that looks pretty good. Now we're going to trim the overhanging dough back to about half an inch. Okay. Now we're just going to fold the dough under on the edge. Folding the dough edge under just helps anchor it and gives that ridge just a slightly thicker edge so we can make a nice crimp and it'll hold. I'm just gonna use two fingers and a thumb. So if the dough gets it all sticky, don't hesitate to reflour your fingers. There we go, looking good. Beautiful. Now this has to rest in the refrigerator for 30 minutes before we can bake it. Okay. All right, so our pie crust is chilled and ready to be par-baked because we need to bake it before we put the filling in. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna line it with foil and then we're gonna fill it with pie weights. Now this is a lot of pie weights. Sure is. This is about a quart of pie weights. And one thing we figured out over the years is the more pie weights, the better. Now they sell them in small containers that are about a pint. So this is about two containers of pie weights. Spread them out nice and evenly in the pie shell. And again, this will prevent those sides from slipping down the sides of the pie plate while we par-bake it. This is gonna go into a 350 degree oven for 30 to 40 minutes. But halfway through, I'm gonna take the pie weights out and I'm gonna spin it around. That way heat can really brown that bottom of the crust. So our pie crust is out and cooling. Now it's time to focus on the chocolate filling. Eggs we found really mitigated the flavor of the chocolate. We want a strong chocolate flavor. So we're gonna make a pudding style, but we're not gonna use any eggs. So it's not a custard, it's pudding. Diner style. That's it. So we're gonna start with some sugar. This is a third of a cup of white sugar. Now we're gonna add our thickener, a quarter cup of cornstarch. Now here's our first little hit of chocolate. This is two tablespoons of cocoa powder. Last but not least, just a little bit of salt. This is a quarter teaspoon of salt. And before we add the heat, we're just gonna whisk this together. 
Make sure that cornstarch, which is the thickener, is nice and evenly distributed through the pot. All right, now we're gonna add the liquid. Now this is three cups of whole milk. Of course we tested 2% milk, that worked pretty well, but when you started using 1% or skim milk, it was just too lean. So stay with the full or the 2%. The heat's not on yet. Just wanna whisk that all in. Make sure there's no lumps of cornstarch. Get into the corners. Now we're gonna put it over medium heat. And it's gonna take about eight to 10 minutes for this really to come to a boil for that cornstarch to be activated. I'm gonna stand here and stir it a lot because we don't want it to clump. All right, Bridget, it's starting to boil around the outside sure of the pan. Can. It's go time. <laughs> so I'm just gonna make sure I whisk it constantly and I'm gonna let it boil for a good 30 seconds. Make sure that all that cornstarch is activated before we remove it from the heat. All right, you can see bubbles across the whole surface of this pudding. Mm -hmm. That is a good sign. That is perfection. Turn off the heat, and that's just cocoa in there. Now's the time when we get to add the chocolate. This is six ounces of chopped bittersweet chocolate. And we're gonna add just a little butter, three tablespoons, just whisking till all that butter and chocolate is melted. Doesn't take much time, because this mixture is hot. When it's chilled down, that butter's gonna re-solidify, help it set up. All right, last but not least, I'm gonna add two teaspoons of vanilla extract. You don't wanna cook the vanilla because you want those flavor compounds to stay in the mixture. All right, so we're <laughs> ready to put this into our cooled pie shell. Oh, yes. Gorgeous. All right, so obviously we're gonna need to let this cool for a bit before we can eat it. We have to let that filling set up. And we found that if you just let it sit in the open air like this, the top dries out and forms kind of a rubbery skin. The answer to that is the piece of parchment paper. I greased it with some vegetable mm -hmm. oil spray. That'll help prevent it from sticking. And I'm just gonna put this flush to the top of the pie. We're gonna let this cool on the counter for about an hour. Okay. And then we're gonna put it in the refrigerator and let it chill for about two and a half hours till it's nice and firm. All right, it is time to top that pie with some whipped cream and get to eating it. Here I have a cup of heavy cream and I'm just gonna add to it one tablespoon of confectioner sugar to make a whipped cream topping. I'm gonna start the whipped cream on low just for a minute, just to get things going. Then I'm gonna crank it to high for a minute or two. We're looking for stiff peaks. All right. I always like to do the last few whisks by hand because I feel like there's always a puddle of cream in the <laughs> bottle that never gets incorporated. Oh, that is perfect. Okay, now, I love this pie because it's messy on purpose, as are all cream pies. You just kind of put whipped topping right in the middle. Mm -hmm. You really do have to top this pie just before serving. This whipped cream doesn't last a long time. So I'm just gonna spread this whipped cream out to the edges. I'm not gonna cover up that gorgeous crust though. Mmm, oh, that's a beauty. This is a snack for later. Mmm, that's a snack for now. <laughs> <laughs> this is for now. And the great thing is you have to eat it right away. Nice, sizable slice for you. Look how the filling really does set up. Look mm. at that pie crust. I know, it's flaking already. First bite. Man, that's good. You know what, it's not too sweet. It's the perfect sweetness. It is silky, it is smooth, it's not gritty at all. But it's almost like a flaky sugar cookie. So good. Mm. Thank you so much My for pleasure. bringing us this beautiful pie and beautiful crust. Well, this luxurious pie all starts with an all butter crust. Process flour, sugar, and salt with cube butter to make a paste. Break into chunks, then pulse in more flour. Toss in frozen butter and water and chill. Roll out trim and crimp, then bake with and without pie weights. For the filling, whisk milk into sugar, cornstarch, and cocoa, and cook until thickened. Add chocolate and butter, pour into the pie shell, and chill. Top with fluffy, silky whipped cream, and enjoy. So from America's Test Kitchen to your kitchen, a blue ribbon winning, congratulations, chocolate cream pie. It's outrageous. Ask a dedicated baker whether they prefer natural or Dutch processed cocoa. You're going to get a serious answer because there's a lot to consider about this product. Jack's here, and he's going to tell us which cocoa powder is best for us bakers. Jack? Yeah, it's controversial. Mm-hmm. People who bake love cocoa powder because it has the most chocolate flavor. Absolutely. Of anything. 
So cocoa powder area is unsweetened chocolate that they've removed a lot of the fat from. What's left? Cocoa solids, the thing that gives you the oomph. It's the cocoa. It's the cocoa. <laughs> so why don't you start tasting? We did this tasting a lot of different ways. This is a chocolate sugar cookie. Some of these are Dutched, some of them are natural. In terms of Dutch cocoa, this was actually a process invented by a Dutch chemist no. and chocolatier in the 19th century where they add an alkali to the cocoa to raise its pH, make it less acidic. So basically what you're doing is those astringent notes kind of get hidden so you can bring out the full chocolate flavor. So a lot of bakers really prefer Dutch processed cocoa because it has, a, they believe, a rounder, fuller flavor. It also changes the color. So the cocoa powder itself goes from what I would call light brown or tawny to deep dark brown. Devilish. Devilish. If you add enough of the alkali, you can almost get black cocoa and that will translate over to baked goods. Two things that we liked. We like dutching. We also like fat. So remember I said that in cocoa powder, they're taking out a fair amount of the fat. But if they take out too much fat, you get a lot of starch. And the reason why starch is so important is because starch can absorb 100% of its weight in moisture. And that, of course, will make a very dry cookie or a dry crumbly cake. Our favorite cocos were Dutched high-fat cocoa powders. Dutched high fat cocoa powder. Yeah, now, of course, that's not labeled. We sent them all out to labs, mm -hmm. had them analyzed, and the difference was pretty substantial. The top cocos had 20 to 22% fat content. The lower rated ones were more like 11 or 12%, mm -hmm. so basically twice as much fat. And so I have a little experiment to bring this to life. So these are equal amounts of cocoa powder, equal amounts of water, heated to 180 degrees, and then cooled. This is our top rated high fat, low starch cocoa powder, you see it's very liquidy and it's going to make a fudgy cake or a chewy cookie. This is a low rated one wow. with a lot of starch and very little fat and it's basically, well that's a brick. <laughs> so I've given you way too much information. The whole point of all that information was to confuse you. Mm -hmm. Have I done that? Uh, indubitably, absolutely you have. First of all, I wanna thank you. They're all cookies made of chocolate. So I'm enjoying myself. Definitely my favorite is this one because I love the chewiness, the moisture in there, and it has a very, very beautiful, deep flavor. So this is my favorite. Okay. Mm -hmm. Take your time. Come back in 20 minutes and yeah. I'll tell you what my second favorite is. I will <laughs> say that although we found very significant differences, mm -hmm. there wasn't anything that was bad. No. This one's a little milky. It's lighter in flavor. Okay. It's not bad, but if, if this wasn't nearby, you know, I'd still eat it. These two, I could take or leave. I would say the only definitive thing I can say is this is my favorite. Let's start with what you are positive about. All right, my favorite. And the tasting panel's favorite. This is Drost. It's a Dutch cocoa that is actually from the Netherlands. High fat, low starch, and absolutely delicious. I've used that for years. It's perfect every single time. All right, I wanna see what this one is. So this was the runner up, yeah. an American company, Guitard. It's also Dutch, also high fat. Thought it made very good cookies and cake. Really nice deep flavor. I'm gonna go all the way to the other end here. So this is Hershey's ah, Natural. Good old Hershey's. You, you called it milky, mm -hmm. mild. It's mm -hmm. sort of familiar. Mm -hmm. Among the natural cocoa powders, it was our favorite, although it was not in the top. All the top cocos were Dutched. Right, right, that is a familiar flavor. And this one? The equal exchange was the one Dutch cocoa powder that our tasters didn't like. We weren't really wild about it. Yeah. The problem here is it's a very low fat cocoa powder. So it's got a lot of that starch, the drying effect. That cookie is much more crumbly rather than the chewier cookies sure. that we liked. Well, there you go. If you want to bake a lot of chocolate cookies or maybe take some home with you or cakes or anything made of chocolate, you're going to need a good cocoa. So why not buy the winner? It's Drost Cocoa and it's $9.99 for 8.8 .8 ounces. Chocolate fudge sauce. Did I get your attention? Probably, because everybody loves this stuff. But unfortunately, most store-bought jars just don't taste very good. They're overly sweet, they're too thick, and they have no chocolatey flavor. But lucky for us, Elle is here today to show us how easy it is to make a good one at home. That's right, and we're decidedly out with the old, gloppy, over-sugared fudge sauce, mm -hmm. but in with the new, easily pourable and reheatable 
chocolate sauce. I like it. And we're going to start with three ounces of unsweetened chocolate. Unsweetened chocolate. We've chosen unsweetened because we want to control the sugar content of the sauce. That makes sense. We tried more than three ounces, a little less than three ounces, but three ounces gives us the perfect flavor and texture. Okie doke. And we just need to chop this chocolate with our serrated knife. The serrated parts go through the chocolate more evenly than a straight edge blade. That looks great. Now that we've got our chocolate taken care of, we can start making the base of the sauce. Okay, not a lot of ingredients here, I like that. A good fudge sauce doesn't need a whole lot of ingredients. We have two thirds cup of whole milk, one and a quarter cup of sugar, and a quarter teaspoon of salt. And we're gonna put it over medium low heat. We tried this recipe with granulated sugar, confectioner sugar, brown sugar, and even corn syrup. But we found that granulated sugar just does the job. And it has the right texture. Yes. So we're just gonna whisk this until the sugar dissolves, and that'll take about five to six minutes. We'll know it's ready because it starts to bubble around the edge of the pot. All right. All right, so it's been about five minutes, and as you can see, it's bubbling. Mm-hmm, the sugar's dissolved. At this point, we're gonna add a third cup of sifted cocoa powder. Now, I know you're probably thinking it's a lot of chocolate on chocolate, but this cocoa powder is gonna add that depth of rich chocolate flavor. All right, so sifted after you measure it, and why do you sift it? Well, we sift it because we wanna get all the lumps out, we wanna make sure that it breaks down evenly in the milk. So a third cup is the perfect amount because any more than that would cause our chocolate to have a chalky flavor. Mm, yeah, because yeah. it's a dried ingredient. All right, so I've taken this off of the heat. I'm just gonna add our three ounces of chopped chocolate and let it melt. Starting to melt, I'm just gonna keep stirring and the residual heat in that liquid will melt the chocolate perfectly. Mmm, that looks good. Oh yeah, it's not quite done yet. We have to let it sit for three minutes. Just to allow the flavors to melt? That's right. Okay, so we've got our ice cream out. So let's finish the sauce. I'm just gonna give it a whisk to make sure that chocolate's completely melted. I'm gonna add four tablespoons of chilled unsalted butter. I'm gonna emulsify. This butter is gonna disperse fat droplets throughout the sauce. It's gonna give it more body and a nice texture. And at the end of it, a little gloss, so it's a win-win. And chilled is important if you want emulsification to happen because it happens slowly. And finally, for a little bit of flavor, one teaspoon of vanilla extract. What I like is that this makes a lot of sauce because you said you could make it ahead and reheat it. Yeah, you can store this in your fridge for up to a month and just reheat it in the microwave. Ooh, hot fudge to order. Easy peasy. Oh, that looks beautiful. All right, you ready for some ice cream? Am I? Shall I do the honors? Please, and don't hold back. Okay, I won't. <laughs> it's not overly thick. It's pourable, but it clings to the ice cream. Oh, wow. Mm. It's so rich. Oh. This is what hot fudge sauce should be. It's such a deep chocolate flavor, but it's not overly sweet, and it's not chewy. Do you ever have those ones that are almost, <laughs> there's the candy, and you can chew through it. Yes. This is like a proper sauce. Well done. Thanks. To make the ultimate chocolate fudge sauce, start by heating sugar and milk on the stove top, then add cocoa and unsweetened chocolate. Finish with butter and vanilla and bring on the ice cream. So from America's Test Kitchen to your kitchen, the ultimate recipe for dark chocolate fudge sauce. You can get this recipe and all the recipes from this season, along with our tastings, testings, and selected episodes on our website, americastestkitchen.com. I think I'm gonna need just, you want a little more? Yeah, I'll take it. Thanks for watching America's Test Kitchen. What'd you think? Well, leave a comment and let us know which recipes you're excited to make, or you can just say hello. You can find links to today's recipes and reviews in the video description. And don't forget to subscribe to our channel. See you later. I'll see you later. <laughs>